Thank you for this recording. Yes, yeah, so my first uh, in-person presentation post-pandemic, so it's strange to give a presentation to stood up. Um, but we'll see, see how I get on. Um, why is my thing happening? There we go. Okay, so there's uh, all the materials today are shared online on a, a GitHub repository, which hopefully uh, where I will link in the chat uh, as we speak. Um, and I should say uh, before I start that this work is a collaboration between my, myself, uh, Paul Schneider, and Wal Mohammed from um, Sheffield University. So think about the sort of background, big contextual uh, things that are happening uh, within health economics. Um, there's a, a shift to new technologies, which we're all part of. Uh, one of those being R and the use of uh, shiny markdown BCA custom packages to do uh, statistical analysis and health economic modeling. Um, and then there's an increased move in kind of all industries towards uh, big data use of real evidence data sets uh, to inform decision making. And then, especially in our industry, there's a move towards sort of big simulation. So uh, that would include things like incorporating uncertainty in, into models. Um, and things that will take a really long time to run uh, on, on your laptop, um, but might be, be quicker uh, sort of run using uh, remote servers. Uh, and the last one, which is kind of what I'm going to focus on here, is the potential kind of long-term shift from recommendations being a static thing that happen, say, every four or five years, and there's a single report to uh, recommendations becoming dynamic. Um, okay, and we refer to that as, as the living HTA. And there's, there's other work kind of ongoing at Sheffield University to describe what that kind of living HTA process might look like. Uh, and there's a nice uh, quote there from, from the nice uh, strategy, 2021 to 2026. And so what I'm going to present today in this presentation is kind of looking at how some of the uh, new technologies in R uh, can feed into improving that process so that we get a dynamic, a living HTA um, kind of process. So um, in terms of my previous work, a lot of the presentations I've given here and elsewhere have been on the use of R Shiny. Uh, and we've seen a couple of presentations today about that. So we have a tutorial paper on the use of R Shiny. Um, and these uh, kind of methods make models in R more usable by humans. So it's taking a little code and making it into a nice user interface, which can be deployed online uh, and used by people to better understand and interact, interact with models. But quite a lot of time this would involve data being shared with a consultant. So if I want to build a, a Shiny app for, for a client, I would generally uh, be required to have the data that's underlying the app and to have that data and deploy the app using that data. Um, so there's a limitation there where, where there's concerns about kind of data security and, and sharing data with, with other people. Uh, also involves quite a lot of human interaction. And so if data is going to be continually updated, so if we want kind of more of a living process where we, we're continually updating our, our recommendations based on new data, then data is going to have to be continually be transferred from the company or whoever um, has the underlying data to the consultant to update the data. Um, so we're trying to develop a kind of a framework, and this is a really at a very, very early stage. And what I'm going to present to you today is just showing kind of what's potentially possible uh, to develop a framework where data doesn't need to be shared. Um, and model reporting can be kind of living to reflect that latest data. So we're going to construct a, we have constructed a script-based health economic model in R, and we're going to use the, the DAS uh, Six Sigma model as an example. We're going to host uh, that health economic model, so that all of the model code uh, on, on GitHub, and we've done it in a simple script format, so there's one script that contains the whole model, but you could do exactly the same thing by just hosting a a package on GitHub and downloading the package. We're then going to show how we use the Plumber package to create an API on a company server. And so in this case, it's just ourselves as an example. And this API is going, it has the sensitive data contained within it. So it's on company server alongside a little sensitive data. And what that does is it enables um, users to query the API. The API is going to source all of the model code from GitHub, pull it into the API. It's going to run the model using the sensitive data, and it's going to return results. So the person who queries the API never actually needs to see the underlying data. 
And uh, then the next stage of what we do, what we do is show how you can create a, a workflow using GitHub Actions to automate that process. So every month, in the first hour of the month, we're going to send a request to that API. That API is going to return a load of results, and then we're going to uh, automate a report in Markdown. And so every month, a report will be generated that's based upon the data on the company server. And so nobody has ever actually accessed that underlying data. Uh, and yet we get an automated report every month. And so we can see kind of loosely how this, how this looks here. So we have our, our API, which sits on the, the company server uh, that has access to the sensitive data also on the company server. We have a load of uh, healthy kind of model code that sits on GitHub. Uh, and that, as I said, could be kind of a, a package that you've created uh, that has just has a single function called run model, and which then calls all other subfunctions necessary to run, run the economic model. And then we have an automated workflow. And what that automated workflow is going to do, as I said, is just at a scheduled time or when something occurs, it's going to query the API. The API is going to run the model, are going to go and grab the model, from, uh, model code from GitHub. It's going to bring it into the API. It's going to grab sensitive data from within the API, run the model, and then return the results. And then a HD report will be generated. Um, so that's the kind of underlying concept behind this. Um, and I'm going to briefly discuss how we kind of do each stage of this. So um, first of all, we're going to talk about how to set up a healthy economic model uh, within an API. And I'm going to use simple DARF six figure model as an example. Um, so this code is very small, <laughs> so it might be easier for me to uh, talk through this and then if, if needed in questions, I'll kind of go into more detail on, on GitHub. All of this code is on, on GitHub kind of as it is. Uh, and we have a, a draft paper, uh, which will also be shared in the chat, hopefully as I'm speaking, uh, which this is pulled from. Um, and the idea is that that's a tutorial paper for kind of how to do this, but the simplest possible example. Um, so we see at the top of here, uh, we load our necessary packages. Um, and this is, uh, you might be familiar with kind of this kind of above function uh, text, which is Roxygen style. Um, it's slightly different in this case because it's a, um, a plumber package. Um, and so what we do is we describe what this API is going to do. We have Roxygen style documentation for the function, so what inputs does it take? And here we have a single input, the first one on line 21, uh, which is just the path to the inputs, and that's where on the server. Um, does the sensitive data lie? And that's data that's not going to be shared with anybody. That's just held on the company server. We then have a, a second uh, argument, which is model functions on line 22. And that's um, literally just saying, give us the path, the URL for the uh, model code. So go and source the model code from that URL. And then finally, we have uh, line 24 through 28. We have um, some parameters that we want to enter into the model that are not sensitive. So these are not things that the company might be worried about sharing. These are things that um, anybody could just query the model with. Uh, we then take the URL from uh, the argument on line 22 and we source it. So we just source that uh, URL. So that will grab all of the model code. Um, we then read in our CSV from our CSV path. So that's the um, line 21, the path to the PSA inputs. Um, and then we overwrite anything in that, um, that file uh, that was non-sensitive and was defined on line 24 with those parameter updates. And then we just run the model. So the model's run here in line 51. Um, and that uses the DAS uh, six second model code that we've sourced from GitHub and just runs the model uh, with the PSA inputs that are provided. Um, and so we really treat the model in this example as kind of a black box. We throw a load of inputs into it, we run the model, and we have some outputs. Uh, this line 55 through 61 um, just checks the results don't contain any of the sensitive data that we don't want to release from the, from the API. And then line 66 uh, onwards just returns the results um, object. So that's kind of how the, the API is structured. So the example version that, that is here is currently hosted on, on uh, our, our Studio Connect. Um, so anybody can query it. You need a, a key, so you need an authentication key, so that obviously you can't just go and 
uh, give anybody access. So in that sense, it's, it's kind of secure. And these very minor checks at the bottom, um, and you want to put more checks in if you're doing this in kind of a real uh, world example, uh, real world case, but these checks are to stop anybody who you have provided the key to from getting anything out of the API you don't want them to. So there's kind of two levels of security. Um, security one is, you know, don't give anybody essentially your password. And security level two is those people who you have trusted and given your password to, you still don't want them to be able to grab the original sensitive results. So then there's a, we've got an example script in the script folder for calling the API from R. Um, and so in this, this is just kind of explaining the process of passing parameters uh, and code to the healthy model, getting it to run on the company server and then getting that, um, the results back. So here you see, this is essentially one big block. So we load in the serial packages at the top. And then we've got this one big block, which are called calling the API. And this uh, is kind of the other side to what I've just shown, which was creating the original function uh, for the API. And so here we've got the URL. So we've got connect.bresmode. So that's the um, Bres uh, humanity hosted um, uh, API. And then within that, We've got our HTA22, this is the example of code, and then the function run Darth model. And so we're saying use that function within that, that server. And we're going to pass uh, some code to it. So our model functions are all contained in um, plumber HE main our Darth functions. So that's all of the Darth functions. But you could, um, what's really nice about this is if you had any changes that you wanted to make yourself, you could direct it to your model. So you could, in theory, have 10 different teams um, who wanted to build their own healthy connect models. They could all build them. And then using the same underlying data, they could all run them. Or one person could, that they could all deploy them uh, on GitHub. And then we could have a, an exercise here, like in three years, where we say, right, we're going to run all of them in one script, all of the different models, and then we're going to compare the results. Um, so it'd be really good for um kind of sensitivity analysis or structural assumptions made in models uh, and it wouldn't involve sharing data with 10 different modeling teams which would be nice uh, and finally we've got a few uh, parameters which we decided to change and in our example shiny app um, we kind of show how um, users can then change some parameters and then the sensitive parameters are kind of kept fixed or sensitive data is kept in the, in the remote server um, and then we've got a few so here we've just got an environment variable, which I'll call connect key, because we don't really want like everybody having access to this. Um, so if you are interested, send me an email and I'll share the key with you. Uh, and then finally, so we return that as a results object. And then we can write that to a CSV. Uh, we can grab some functions. So we've got some functions to make a C app, we've got a to play. And then here we've got an example, uh, our markdown uh, file. So we're just going to render a, a markdown report using the outputs. Uh, from the, the results object to create that markdown report. So finally, um, this is the, the kind of GitHub Actions workflow. Essentially, what we're doing here is going to schedule a job, and this is a, a cron job. So the one, one, one there, mine six, basically says that on the first minute of the first hour of the first day of every month, uh, we're going to run this code. And we're going to run it on line 11. We're going to run it on a Windows 2019 computer uh, server. And we're going to give access to my GitHub um, account so that it can pull uh, this whole repository that all those codes contained in. It's going to share that repository with GitHub. It's not going to share the underlying data because the underlying data is on the company server. It's then going to install R. It's going to install uh, Markdown, install TinyText, which is needed for Markdown. And then it's going to install a load of R packages. We need to do this analysis. And then right down here, it's going to run the script that I just discussed. So on line 47, it's going to run that script that grabbed, that, that sent the model code to the company server, ran the model on the API, and retrieved the results, and then created a markdown uh, report. And then on line 50, it's going to create a pull request to the GitHub uh, repository that will contain the new markdown report. And so if I go, 
to GitHub, we can see that I have a pull request and it's living HDA automated model run. And you can see all the times that it's sent it to me. And now if I go to uh, pull request patch as a branch, I can go into the outputs folder and I should have a PDF report. And this is the latest uh, model run. So if any of the underlying data changes, the uh, report will like change the next time it's run. And so if the company decides to change their, their underlying data, um, the next time this is run, this will just use that new data and we would never have to have seen that data. You can also schedule this kind of upon request. So like if they said, oh, we've changed the data, um, you could just click run and it would, it would automatically run for you. Um, right. I don't know where I've gone now. <laughs> Can't see the top. There we go. Yeah, got it. <laughs> um, so in terms of a wider discussion about these methods, so advantages, um, the big advantage to, for me is security. So we originally kind of set this up thinking how would a living HTA system work? And then very quickly realized that probably the biggest limitation is just the huge quantities of data that have to be sent backward and forward, especially as we move towards a world with more real world evidence used. And if we're gonna have things automatically update all the time, there's just gonna be so much data being emailed backward and forward um, that it starts to get really impractical. Um, Transparency, um, so separating the model code. I think there's one thing that people could take away uh, from the session that I hope that we kind of start doing more and more of is separating the code from the data and sharing the code. Because just because you've got some sensitive data doesn't mean that you don't, that you shouldn't share your code. Um, and this completely allows you to do that because the, the, the code is completely separate from the data. Everything that's sensitive is in one place and the code can just be put on GitHub. Um, and so I can see a situation in the future where uh, like even NICE has a just repository full of everyone, every model that's done in R, all of the code is shared, uh, which would be really good. Um, all of the computational burden is handled on the remote server, so we don't have models run on laptops. Um, and that's great for storage as well, so large data, data sets can be stored there. And these API calls can be made anytime. Um, and like I said, they can be made by different groups with different models to allow for structural uncertainty. Uh, to be analyzed. Uh, in terms of disadvantages, the biggest one for me is the technical skill set. Um, like we're trying to persuade people to move from Excel and spreadsheets to code. Trying to persuade them to then go to like automated GitHub Actions is probably like a step too far. Um, but I think, I think so. I think maybe it's like taking people with us bit by bit. Um, and then the other big one is security. So people just being concerned about like having people from outside their uh, institution querying an API. And, and taking results or taking anything from that, that API. And that's, I think, something that, that really we, so we, we need to discuss and, and, and figure out how that would, that would work. Because this is done in other industries. This is not like it's some crazy new method. It's like all of our banking data is shared in this way. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, yeah, really early stage kind of uh, methods paper. Um, the paper should be shared, hopefully, um, as I'm talking. Um, and we really welcome contribution on the uh, GitHub repository. There's a discussions tab, uh, and some people have started adding, adding discussion points there. So, yeah, thank you. Thanks very much, Rob. That's um, amazing work, what you're doing. Um, it is like there, there's so much to say about this topic because um, we've, we've run into this problem where Ishan and I were using NGR data. Which is so sensitive they wouldn't let us uh, mm -hmm. share aggregate summaries of it. So we have to create dummy data for mm -hmm. this. But there's still the, the legal and political question that I don't know if they'd actually agree to having an API installed on their servers running it. Yeah. Um, so have you actually got any companies or any registries to agree to this? No, this is so this is um super, super early stage of could we do it and is it possible? Uh, kind of method style paper. I think, so there's the one side, which is what I've described, which is, um, can we get a company to commit to make this data available? 
this is another question of can I, APIs be used more widely to allow um, different groups to collaborate? And that might not look exactly like this. That might look like, um, you know, John Luca having an API for VCEA, and then somebody else having an API for their, API, uh, their R package, and then somebody else having an API for their um, Python package. And then actually Python and R can talk together really nicely and all the computation is done outside. Um, so I think there's a wider discussion about APIs. Getting, com getting specific companies to commit to it would be really hard. Like, that's what you see as something the neo genes could do. Yeah. If the company had to submit an API for the data set, then we could run our own survival analyses, not have to rely on them doing it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That would be very helpful. Uh, I think we all think like cause and doing the APL genes. Crystal might be able to do that crystal level. Uh, I think it's the, yeah, it, it does solve a lot of data access. It could solve a lot of data access problems where it's, yeah, it's a bit of a licensing issue preventing you having uh, copies of it. I don't know how you don't stop people getting, but often you're allowed to see the data, but you're just not allowed to necessarily use their service. Mm -hmm. And this offers a solution to that where you can code the model on your own, upload it to it, and then have it run. But even mm -hmm. if the model is spider analysis, it doesn't have to be the full model. No, no. So I still prefer Excel models when it comes to models and the analysis will feed it all to come up. But this could be the survival analysis that can be done that way. I think that's the, and it is going to take so much insight. So I think it's suited more to consultancy function relationships than it is to ERGs for us. Is that how you pay? Yeah, who do you think would be there? Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I think that's something that there needs to be a wider discussion on. On who would do. I could see different uses for different, um, so different institutions using it in potentially different way. So I could see Nice might have data that they would not want to share outside of certain groups, but they would want the model to rely on. So it could be like discounts or something, um, and they might be willing to have an API for that that they wouldn't want anybody outside of certain users to have access to. Um, so yeah, I could see different different institutions using it in different ways. So your question answer is that this so stripping out the population that that's not possible. <coughs> Something just you need the data and it often presents the data. So like you just take spiral times. If you do the swimming plot, that is literally the data presented like there's no other way of producing it without the data being explicitly there so it's before. So what do you mean by like stripping out the confidential data? So for confidential data, it would mean, so say you had a, uh, like a price or something that was included in your sensitive data, you would search through all the data. And if you found that, that value somewhere, you would say, no, you can't, you can't return this data that's sensitive. Um, so stuff like, it's essentially to try and stop the person who you've trusted and given the password, the key to stop them from then grabbing all your sensitive data, the whole, everything's gonna be logged anyway on an API. So like they'll know at 3.15 um, and Hatswell downloaded all this data and he shouldn't have done, which is a good thing to know because you know exactly what's been like retrieved from the API. Um, but then there's just some sense checks to make sure someone's not like changed their model code to say like return inputs. Um, so it's not, got to, it's, I don't think it's gotta be like really cutting edge. I think it's just gotta be like a fail safe to stop people from doing something really silly. Um, um, so, uh, Pedro, and then we've got two questions on one. Uh, Robert, yeah. really amazing to work with and uh, really interesting. And it's very good that you got a new set of effects about this. I think this is going to shake up the system in the next. Um, just thinking about your example there, I don't know if I understood correctly. So, is, is the model uh, that you're using, is it static? Are the assumptions, the structural assumptions around the model static as well? Because I, 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 I could. Understand that there's you, you have different evidence as, as evidence is coming up, you have different evidence coming in, but that might also influence the, the, the structure of the model because, like like uh, Anthony was saying, I think the idea for nice is that with this living value lens is that they, they want to make decisions earlier when there isn't a lot of evidence, and when you don't have a lot of evidence, implies that you make you make a lot of assumptions and in your structure of model would be simplified because of that. When when you have more and more evidence, that understanding of the, the model and 
France and the EU reflect better the, 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 the Quebec way, um, might, might also change. So I don't know if, if, if the, the model can change yes. as well. Yes, essentially what we're doing is we're keeping the, the data with the API and the model posted online on GitHub. And so that model can just be updated whenever you want. I mean, you could pass 10 different models to it if you wanted. Um, so if, you know, if, if Nathan comes along and goes, no, I think Rob's model's crap, you can fork my repository, make a load of changes, and then pass his model to it. Um, and so, it, you know, it can kind of grow as well. Um, if it's just that separating the data from the, the model code. So there's two in the in the chat. So uh, John, so this is a reference to Python. Uh, I'm not a programmer and wonder how readily it would be it would be to create an app that integrates both Python and made the use of AI for automated systematic review and R to do the number crunching. Um, I'd, I'm not sure about Python for automatic automatic automated systematic review. I think that's probably a kind of a, a separate topic. Um, but I think essentially anything Python and R are very similar programming programming languages. So essentially anything you can do in one, you you kind of can do in the other. Um, yeah, R has kind of been more adopted, obviously, by this community. And I think in health economics and, and stats generally, data science um, Python is used more in fintech and and kind of a, a lot of other industries. Um, so yeah, it's kind of hard to to answer that. But just as a point, Python does have a lot of AI tools that can be used for textual analysis in systematic reviews. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, like, and having different um, different functionality hosted on different APIs, so having packages hosted on APIs, would then mean that you can stitch that together more easily now. So I guess for us, our like default would be R and then call the API that's running the Python code because we're already familiar with R. But somebody else, their, their default might be Python, and then call the, the R function from an API that's hosted by you know, John Luca or Nathan or whoever. Um, so, but it allows that it's, it's kind of more interoperable. Um, and as soon as we're doing something like EVPI or something that takes a long time to run, you can then host that on a remote server rather than trying to run it on your laptop. Um, what do you think this is more suited to connecting real-world evidence sources, which are regularly updated, rather than company trials? Um, yeah, so I think I think this really lends itself really well to to real-world real -world evidence. Um, but I think we have worked in instances where we've had kind of updated cuts of data. Um, so you know, like a year, and then every three months after that, you get another cut. Um, and so maybe it's quite useful for companies to be able to see. You know, every time their, their trial data updates, what that looks like, and that's kind of in an automated process, and they could just log on and have a look at the new report, rather than that process having to be like, here's the new data, we're going to email it to you, and then you know, yeah, that that has its security limitations. Or can you send us the new code? We don't really know how to use R. We're struggling with this package. This is kind of to me, this is a lot simpler uh, and cleaner. Um, but yeah, I agree that. That if we start moving to a place where like NHS digital data is being used to inform health economic models, then we kind of have to start moving to something that looks like this. Um, yeah. John, we take one more question. Yeah. On that point, if you if you never see the data that your model is built on, how do you trust the results of the model? Yeah. So I think so. What? There's a couple of different things you could do. But the most common, I think, would be to um, have an, a functionality to be able to download or retrieve uh, like pseudo data from that data set, in exact, which has the same structure, but might have like random numbers generated from like a, a similar distribution. Um, and then that would enable you to build your model well enough um, to then run it. But I, for the most part, I would see this as being like a model update. So you build your model once, and then when you know it's going to be like you know another cut of data, or a slight variation on data, rather than having to keep rerunning the model, so you build it once, and then you you do this process, and then that's you kind of done, and you're just maintaining rather than having to build a model every, an, an update every like six months or something. Yeah. 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 Yeah.